Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dan Hamilton. I direct the Global Europe Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And we're delighted to uh, talk about an issue that is really in the news. Um, you know, as vaccinations are rolling out now in many countries, uh, there is a real interest in how we can move again out, uh, travel around, be out in public with some sense of trust and health. So the term vaccine passports has emerged. Uh, some wonder whether that's even the right term uh, that we should be using, but there is a, a whole set of initiatives going on in many countries to try to address this issue of how do we sort of open up again uh, and yet still feel uh, safe. Uh, in the United States, uh, a state like New York has already introduced a state pass uh, that uh, certifies that one is vaccinated and, and, and recently tested. Um, but states like Florida and Texas, the governors have said, uh, you can't do that. They prohibit uh, government mandated vaccination, uh, barring businesses from requiring that customers show such uh, credentials. The Biden administration has said there is no, uh, there will be no federal mandate date in the United States requiring everyone to obtain a single vaccination credential. But then you have a country like Israel, which has uh, had a you know quick uh, vaccine uh, program vaccination and is now rolling out a green pass. Um, and there are many private initiatives underway all, all over the place. It's hard to make uh, sense of them, which we hope to do today. Uh, a commons project that's used by lots of airlines already. Uh, they are in touch with the European Union. The European Union is discussing a digital green pass. Um, and so there's a lot going on. We would like to try to make some sense of all that and what it might mean uh, today. And so uh, there are a number of critics that are saying, you know, there are lots of, this raises lots of ethical issues, um, medical issues, even still digital security issues, political issues. So uh, it's a real tangle and we want to untangle it today with our guests. So I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have with us today, Ron Rosendahl, who's with the Dutch Ministry of Health who's been very involved in the European Union uh, e-health network and all everything that's happening in Europe. Um, Brian Bailendorf is the executive director of the Linux Foundation, uh, which is working on the COVID credentials initiative. Um, Deanne Kassim, who's the executive director for health policy at Change Healthcare, another uh, initiative. And then Melinda Mills, who's a professor at Oxford University, uh, who has authored a study looking at the all of these initiatives, some broader context uh, in trying to uh, help us understand is the, their implications. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to be brief, to lead us off with some opening remarks, say five to seven minutes, and then uh, we'll turn to questions and to your own comments. Uh, the audience could participate. You can uh, join us in the discussion today, uh, either via email, send us a comment or a question at uh, GEP, so Global Europe Program, GEP at wilsoncenter.org, or send us a tweet at Wilson Center GEP. Again, that's GEP at wilsoncenter.org, or send us a tweet at Wilson Center GEP. And I'll remind you later when we come back to the audience. So I think it might be uh, useful, Ron, if it's okay that we start uh, with, uh, with you. Uh, what's happening in Europe? How, how, how far advanced is this idea of a green pass? Uh, is it at the EU level? Is it uh, is the Schengen zone, the, the opening, uh, you know, the travel arrangements that European countries have? Or, and how does that affect different EU uh, countries? Uh, it's seen from the United States, it's hard to, you know, understand exactly what's, what's going on. And, and you're on mute, so. Okay, there we yes, go. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dan, for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. And thank you for that question. That shows you have quite some insight into how the EU is organized. Um, I am working for the Dutch government, but I'm the co-chair of the European Union EOS network for the member states. And the Digital Green Certificate is a EU Commission initiative. So it's for the EU for the, for the total of 27 member states and the initiative started um, at the end of last year uh, when most European countries were about to start their vaccination campaign 
and um, we then organized meetings with all those member states to see if we could come to some sort of a agreement on how to deal with um, cross-border uh, travel after opening of the border um, in, the, in the next few months. Um, and up till then, we had a wide variety of entry rules in the European Union, where some uh, member states required a one PCR test and others required additional rapid tests. Uh, so we had um, quite some different entry rules for cross-border uh, travel within the uh, EU. And, and there was, the fear was that proof of vaccination would at some point be added to that equation and, and would further complicate the possibility of travel between member states. So what we did um, in where um, the freedom to move freely within the EU is a right we hold very dearly um, and is enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, we tried to come to um, coordination to, uh, to, to, to not to, to that to not come to a plethora of potential certificates, but come to an agreement that we would align our initiatives between the 27 uh, member states. Um, and the eHealth network of the union uh, was tasked with the technical preparation of, of coming to that coordination. And we worked very closely with the uh, European Commission on, on what we now call a trust framework and minimal data sets. Um, and at the same time, the commission itself uh, drafted a proposal, uh, a legislative, legislative proposal for a regulation uh, for that digital green certificate that was published on the 17th of March. And the proposal sets the condition upon which all certificates need to comply with. Um, and the core of it that the regulation ensures that there is reciprocal access, acceptance of three types of certificates across the union. Vaccination is one of them. Uh, test uh, is, is uh, the second and recovery certificates is the third proof of natural immunity. So it's all about preventing transmission of virus based on either vaccination or having a recent negative test or having recovered from a, a, an episode of having COVID. Um, and the regulation only aims at cross-border passage, so at cross-border use and not on domestic use within the uh, um, member states. Um, and it's not a, a single European solution for everyone. So it's not one app, for example. It, it leaves member states free to develop their own national solution. And some leave that up to private companies. And some, um, like the Netherlands, start their own process and, and come up with their own um, national um, certificates, um, be it on paper or digital uh, in the form of, uh, of apps. Um, and all those national initiatives have to comply with the uh, EU digital green certificate rulings. Um, and um, as vaccination is voluntary and, and it, it cannot be coerced, uh, um, um, there is no way of tracking. There is, no, there is free choice to, to, to choose one of those three ways of proving you are not able tra to transmit the virus when cross border uh, use uh, when, when crossing the borders um, and I expect that the legislation is approved by the European leaders and the European Parliament uh, by June and we have been hard, uh, working hard on a solution um, within the Union and also are coordinating that with the WHO and the uh, ICAO, for example, and IATA. Um, the planning for us is that the pan-European solution is available uh, before the summer holidays that start in July in, uh, in uh, the European Union. And the first tests of are planned for May, um, with uh, the, some member states being uh, ahead, uh, of which Germany and the Netherlands are too. Um, and the speed is unprecedented in Europe. Um, so we have both the legislation ready in June um, as the technical and interoperable solutions. Um, in the Netherlands, we have, we have developed a fully open source app. You can find the source code on, on GitHub, on the ministry page on GitHub, and that allows uh, citizens to have their verified test certificates in a privacy-friendly privacy way available on a mobile device and if they want in a paper form. 
and this allows them, for example, to enter a music or arts festival, football matches, museums, and by proving they are not um, having COVID, uh, have a testing ne negative, or uh, in some weeks um, have been vaccinated also. And the solution uh, prevents um, from being tracked across use, so you cannot be tracked in in what use uh, the QR codes that are, are changing every uh, a few minutes, um, and it doesn't uh, fully identify you, so that uh, people cannot track your identity over, for example, the cafes you visit, um, at, and, and at the same at, at the same time still being able to show it, it's you who is uh, negative. Um, and we have learned a lot for the contact tracing apps. That was the first European-wide effort in which all national contact tracing apps are uh, combined, are interoperable, so that a Dutch person having um, his app and meeting someone um, having the German app in Berlin and then traveling back will still get notified in the Dutch app of having met a person that afterwards uh, proved to have uh, COVID. Um, and, and from there, it, it is trust and interoperability that are crucial. So that's what we are doing. Um, and we are more than happy to, to share our experience, experience in that. And, and uh, as I said, the source code is, um, the Dutch source code is open source and available on GitHub. Um, back to you, uh, Tom. Thanks so much. I think an important distinction there uh, between the EU initiative, which is cross-border and then various nation state efforts on just opening up society, which might have a different uh, track. At least in the US, it seems to me, at least the public debate that I've been following kind of mixes that all up. It just calls passports, uh, even if it's just to go down the street. Uh, and so maybe we should clarify some of that. And yes. in the US, as I said, there's a big debate now you know, whether the federal government really has a role to play or not. Uh, and uh, whether private industry, in fact, and private initiatives won't be more the engine that introduces these uh, initiatives. So, Brian, if I yeah. could thank you, you've been leading. Can I just add, yeah, yeah. Dan, can I add one yeah. thing to that? Yeah. Um, in, the, uh, uh, in the European standards, there are three ways of showing your um, certificate. There is one which is for domestic use, which doesn't show any details. There is one that's for cross-border use that shows your identity and there is one for medical use that fully shows all your vaccination details so there are three use cases and all of them have different data sets that's interesting yes thank you so brian uh, you've been uh, helping to lead an initiative here the covid credentials initiative and i wonder if you could tell us about that and uh, its status how it relates to the discussion as we've been having Sure. Thanks for, for having me here. Um, so uh, uh, I'm executive director of the Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative, which is a sub part of the Linux Foundation. And uh, since July, we have been working with the private sector, along with public health authorities around the world on a number of different technologies suitable for the fighting in the against the pandemic. The first domain was in exposure notification, where we worked with the Irish authorities, the Canadian authorities uh, and companies that were service providers to them to work on common open source software to help standardize and make it really easy for countries to adopt these technologies and uh, choose a technology that actually hits a pretty high bar for uh, privacy uh, because we felt if people couldn't trust these apps, they wouldn't use them. And part of that comes by the software being open source uh, and being able to show here's what's running underneath. So I'm really glad that Ron's team has, has uh, published the source code to that. But Part of it as well comes from also showing, hey, there's an open governance model to how this software is built, that the conversations around design uh, and such are happening on a, on a very transparent basis and taking into consideration the full range of different policies and ideas uh, that span from Europe to Asia to positions in the US and elsewhere. <clears throat> In December, we uh, brought uh, in uh, the COVID creds initiative. This is a group that actually started last March applying this new field of self sovereign identity, which is kind of a new take on digital identity, uh, distributed digital identity that has evolved over the last five years, really uh, into something that is now uh, and even before the pandemic uh, running in production in a number of different countries that fundamentally moves us away from this idea of identity being something interesting about you sitting on a server somewhere and instead uh, something embodied 
embodied in a set of certificates that you would hold in a wallet very close to you. And that when you go and you present these in other places, there's no real time check between like the, the bouncer at a, at, a, at a concert, the ticket taker at a concert and the issuer of that credential. You know, there's no real time you know, connection there. It, like there would be if I were say logging into a website with my Google account instead everything is done very locally. And in that one sense, it's privacy preserving. And so there were quite a few of us who realized this was going to actually be important should you know we all get lucky and have vaccines uh, and, and start to be able to roll those out. People are really going to need to be able to show that to not just cross borders, but potentially to enter other crowded spaces, you know, even long before we've uh, had a chance to get this disease actually to zero, uh, should we ever, which we all hope we do. So, um, so since December, we've all been working together uh, on a set of standards, on a set of guidance for public health authorities, really in collaboration with them, as well as the uh, private sector, uh, uh, and, 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 and soon on a set of open source software packages that will help make adopting the privacy preserving approaches to these, like uh, what, what the European Union team has been building, um, uh, easy and standardized across the US um, what we're, and, and around the world, really. Uh, and, and this really can only come from this public participation, this public collaboration that we in the open source community really know how to do well. What has come out of this is some re realizations though that what um, this first wave of apps that we're seeing, uh, whether it's the Excelsior Pass in New York, whether it's things like the Common Pass system uh, being used elsewhere, um, really don't answer the, 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 the true needs of privacy and don't meet up the expectations of citizens for what these digital uh, versions of the white card or the WHO yellow card would actually like to do. Um, we need to first separate the idea of proof of vaccination, uh, uh, verification of vaccination, or test results, or even a, a testament from a doctor that's been recognized by an authority that says, I have helped for health reasons, I am not able to get the vaccines that are available today, right? We have to consider that from an equity point of view. Um, uh, when we need to separate those kinds of proofs from the passes, that would be like when you apply to get a visa to go to a country, when you apply, when you go and you get a concert ticket, right? Uh, or if you want to enter a bar and you have to prove you're over the age of 18, like in those specific use cases, in those specific scenarios, you want one time pass or very limited time uh, pass kinds of things where the amount of information in that is dramatically smaller than you would have in your proof of vaccination, right? On my white card, I have information about the batch of, of Pfizer that I got right? Um, the, there's no reason why a, a ticket taker at a concert hall should need that. So what has been motivating us in this community is figuring out what are the, what are the really privacy preserving approaches to take with this? Uh, and in particular, how do we avoid recreating the cookie problem? 25 years ago, an innocuous header was added to the web standard for how web browsers and servers talk to each other that very few people thought would actually be used to create the uh, kind of surveillance dystopia that we have now on the web. But sure enough, it's been the key to building all sorts of third party information about us as we browse around the web. If we were to use these credentials in the wrong way, if we were to, to design the protocols in the wrong way, then that concert hall, the uh, restaurant, the government authority would all be able to collude to build a picture of where you go and what you do. Uh, and that would be a real, uh, that, that, would, that would not only be a shame, we would be contributing to the surveillance dystopia that we otherwise are, are, are I think, doing everything to try to avoid. Um, we also I think um, are really motivated by the idea that this can serve as the basis for tackling one of the biggest problems in health IT, at least in the United States, but I know in many other countries, which is the master patient index problem. The, the fact that your identity in a healthcare record system is not connected to your identity in a different health record system, uh, except by the weakest of measures. And, and that makes it really hard to share health information with you to allow you to be the pivot point for the sharing of health records. Uh, and if we can get, start to get a stronger digital identity system around healthcare implemented in a way that consumers can trust, I, I, we can start to tackle that that really big problem. Um, I'll end with you know this is these passport systems, these pass systems, these uh, wallets as we prefer to call them, need to be trusted more like the way that consumers trust their mail client or their web browser than the way that they might trust their Uber app sitting on their phone. You know your Uber app, you don't think of as yourself having domain over the data that sits inside that. You don't really have the means to be able to call you know drivers from Lyft or or other systems through that Uber app. It's not a portal to a, a broad network. It's a portal to a specific company, right? 
And likewise, if these past systems are limited to a specific state or to a specific set of use cases, people won't set, feel that sense of agency over the data that is inside them and the sharing and the consent management uh, that they wish to express through that. And instead, what I think we'll see are wallet software that really can be the basis for storing lots of these kinds of, of health data or other types of digital certificates, um, your education history, your uh, uh, you know engagement in other parts of society where you need to prove a thing about yourself or, or some other aspect, um, separate from an app that might be very particular to vaccinations, test results, and, and, and that sort of thing. So these are the kinds of issues that we're uh, working on at the Linux Foundation uh, and, and uh, lots of things that permeate these conversations here. Thank you, Brian. So Deanne, if I could turn to you, you're also engaged uh, very much in this field and uh, again, other initiatives. Uh, maybe you could tell us about your, your involvement and, uh, and how people should understand uh, these, these initiatives, please. Certainly, thank you, Dan. Well, when you look at where the conversation was going at the end of last year, I think at Qantas, I believe, was one of the first airlines that came out and said, when there is a vaccine, we will want proof of either a negative test and or a vaccine. And it was really the travel industry that started this conversation. And so we realized, along with other companies in the Vaccine Credential Initiative, Common Pass, everything that you know, Brian just mentioned, that there could be a need for this, similar to your boarding pass that you have um, in a QR code to get on an airline. Um, but how do we take that to a place which is preserving privacy that doesn't live on somebody else's server? And that really is up to the consumer. The consumer should have the choice as to whether they choose to participate in the vaccination process, because as Brian mentioned, there are people for religious exemptions or religious exceptions, I should say, or pre-existing conditions that they can't take a vaccine. So this was never meant to exclude certain individuals from participating in society. What it is is a proof of your vaccination status. And I, and I do wanna commend the Biden administration for saying that the federal government was not going to control this. It really is not an official passport. But what they have done, and I do think this is, um, this is very needed, is to visit with all of these companies, have a listening, listening session with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT and try to determine what open standards make the best. How do we have a common framework? Because there are certainly a lot of players in this industry and consumers just want to know if I can get access to that credential, if I've had my vaccine, if I want to go on a cruise and cruises have already said they're going to require proof of vaccination and or negative testing. Um, how do I do that? And what we did is we took the idea of right now we're working with pharmacies um, and, and getting that information from the pharmacy to make it as, as clear and as few data fields as possible. So as Brian was saying, you know, we don't want this to be used for surveillance. It's a, it's a place where a consumer can text passport to a long code or credential to a long code and answer some verification questions to confirm their identity and get that QR code or they can have an email to them because we realize that not everybody is smartphone enabled. We want this to be equitable. And that information is in the, in the control of the consumer. It either lives on your phone, you can delete it immediately. You can delete your email, you can print it out and you can delete it and go get it again, should you need it. Um, but we realized that privacy and equity were absolutely the things that needed to be preserved for this. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is I, I'm saddened to see some of this become so politicized because I've seen conversations or I've heard conversations um, where folks are concerned about this is going to create barriers or a caste system, if you will. We're going to ostracize the, vac the not vaccinated and elevate the vaccinated. And if you think about it, first and foremost, there's been no federal you know, ban on this. And I will say though, that states are taking things into their own hands. And we are a country that is of states' rights with state rights often preceding federal guidance. And so as of last week, for instance, we've seen 95 bills in 36 states prohibiting employers um, or the government from either mandating a vaccine or discriminating against uh, vaccination status. So I just wanna point that out because I think that's an important part of this conversation. Um, as you mentioned, Dan, at the beginning of this session, we've seen certain states, Florida and Texas, saying there will be no government issued passports, there will be no vaccine passport requirements in these states. Um, we've seen other states though, such as California, who is um, working right now to, on a policy that will say, if you go to an indoor live event, such as a concert, 
you will have proof of a vaccine or you will have proof of a negative COVID test within a certain amount of time. So as you can see, policymakers are all over the place in, in terms of what works for their state, what works for their population. But again, we always put this out there as a credential that was up to the consumer to drive, not for governments to control, not for companies to really take this and run with and create um, discrimination in their policies. Um, Lastly, I will say, as we look at the public health infrastructure, which as we know, this pandemic has really shown a glaring light on what didn't work so well in the healthcare system and what needs to be improved, but also how we have really not invested in our public health infrastructure, whether it be staffing, supply chain, IT. This tool, again, with proper consumer opt-in and privacy protections can also be used to send vaccine status, to send vaccine reminders to, again, consumers who want to opt in and have this pushed out to them through a third party app or a credential at some point in the future. Uh, do you know when your last tetanus shot was? Do you know when you're due? Just as one example. And how do you also, if you're a mom with kids and you have a busy life, how do you remember all of their vaccination statuses, particularly if they're coming up on going to college where now you've got a whole list of vaccines that on-campus housing might might require. So for everything that has been talked about, how this really does go down a slippery slope, and I'm not denying that, there's a lot of positive things that can come out of this technology. And we're really only in the, you know, version 1.0 of all the possibilities of where something like a credential can lead to. Thank you so much, uh, Deanne. Uh, you've addressed, and uh, Brian, a couple of the potential concerns some people have. Um, but Belinda, you've been looking at this in depth, and uh, perhaps you can um, offer some thoughts of how people should just be thinking about all of this, and what it, what does it mean? Uh, you know, how how should we understand what the possibilities are and some of the maybe the slippery slope implications? Thank you very much, Dan. So just to give everyone an idea, I wrote, uh, co-authored a Royal Society report on, on COVID certificates or vaccine passports. It's available if you look up Royal Society in the UK, it's freely available online. And what we thought we needed was really something more multifaceted because we found that people were looking at legal aspects or discrimination or technical aspects. So we decided to look at it across multiple different uh, realms and looking you know, at, the, at the technical part about infection and immunity. We also wanted to look at you know, the logistics of it and behavior and ethics. So it gives an overview um, you know, at that time in February <laughs> what, the, what the situation was. And I mean, I won't go through all the 12 criteria, but just let me highlight a few because I think the other speakers have uh, aptly hi highlighted uh, quite a few points. But the first one we thought was really important was that governments just be clear about what are the uses, where will it be used? And I think in the beginning, that's where it caused, and still in the UK, it causes a lot of confusion. And there's huge debate uh, now um, here hinging on, you know, will it be used in the pub? You know, and that creates a lot of emotions among people as well, too. So we're currently in the UK piloting it um, in large sports events, um, you know, for, for football, soccer, um, and snooker, and all of these these different events and um, you know just to see how it will work. So people really want to know that it won't be banned from they won't be banned from essential services and you know what are the red lines which the Prime Minister on Easter Monday gave a press conference and it was very clear that they did have some red lines. People need to know about those. The other thing was about infection and immunity. So the other speakers just spoke about that. And we talked about the different types of tests and you know what, what sort of ones would be useful to establish infection and, and immunity. And I think there's still some questions. Um, you know, as of tomorrow, uh, the UK government is offering free lateral flow, flow tests to the entire population um, to be tested two times a week. And they're suggesting that that can also be part of the, the COVID certification process. So vaccination, COVID certification, and proof of immunity. Um, there's been quite some discussion about it because we know that from behavior that people um, during track and trace, they don't come forward to be tested. One of the reasons is that they don't have the financial means to quarantine um, if they need to quarantine. So there's been a lot of discussion about inequalities there. Also the legal aspects, many of you <laughs> already talked about that as well. That's a raging debate here as well in terms of employers. And I think a lot of the discussion was around human rights, equality, 
um, you know, in privacy, but, um, you know, you know what, what employers need to do uh, still remains a gray area, and that's a huge discussion here. Is it a duty of care for, you know, if I, for my nursing home residents, you know, that everyone's vaccinated, or, you know, for my clients and customers? And it looks like, as Deanne was just saying, you know, there's, there's lots of different, um, uh, different state solutions for that, um, but also across the, across the country. So that's been a debate. Technically, I think that's been covered already by Brian. Um, you know, I just were in, and as well, I mean, we're really worried. Uh, uh, Ron was talking about it as well. In the UK, we're worried about interoperability across multiple different type, types of devices. And um, when I had to sign up for my settled status, so I'm a, I have a Canadian and Dutch nationality, but I work here as a Dutch citizen. And when I had to sign up, um, it was only available on an Android device. So, you know, the advice from the government, I had to borrow an Android device and upload my biometric private data for myself and my family in order to remain working here. So you can imagine that, you know, these, uh, the citizens are worried in some countries when governments develop their own DIY solutions. I was very happy to hear about um, what Ron was talking about, open source code, um, because there, there was really some, some concerns um, um, in countries. And, you know, and just about data privacy and security, I mean, just what we've talked about today, this is the dystopian reality that's discussed everywhere that, you know, we're going to be tracked, it's going to be sent for my immigration status, it's going to be linked to housing. And I think it's really important to get that information out about, you know, that this data, you know, will be used or like the, the Danish app where, you know, there's a sundown clause that, you know, this data won't be used at or stored after a particular period. And then just to, to finalize, um, you know, one thing we plead for was an internationally standardized um, <laughs> criteria because we're a global uh, world. So we can see across states, but we see it across the European Union. So we're, we're just, we're just really hoping that, that somebody will listen to that. Um, I'm a baseball fan. I watched the Texas Rangers versus the Blue Jays on Monday. And when I saw that stadium full, um, it was hard to enjoy the game. So I think unless we get some sort of clarification, different places will do different things. Um, it relates a lot to what Deanne was saying about polarized societies. And, and um, you know, in the UK, in the US, we have very polarized societies and it's often connected to civil liberties. And I think we have to really realize how people are seeing this and we have to engage with them, um, you know, about, you know, this isn't about your rights, this is about protection and this isn't about tracking and, and, and you know, and I think we just can't underestimate that narrative. It came up with face coverings. It's just the same thing repeating itself. It actually came up in the 1800s, almost <laughs> the same thing. Uh, civil liberties comes up all the time. Finally, I think, um, as was discussed, just people want to know who's going to be excluded. So we can't, um, we know COVID's um, revealed uh, these deep inequalities in many of our societies, and we just have to be really clear if there's vaccine hesitancy among certain ethnic groups or, or pregnant women um, don't get vaccinated or people don't get tests for different reasons, we really have to clarify, as many of you were saying already, about you know, what's in place um, for those people that aren't able to, to do these tests or, or have a vaccine. So that's just our, our broad uh, interpretation of the issue. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. Thanks to all of you. So I already have many questions, uh, and I have some of my own. Um, let me just uh, let me just provide some questions and let uh, and then come back to you. And you pick and choose which ones you feel you can take on, and so we don't have to address every one. But uh, you know, one is just a very practical issue, probably for Americans thinking about going to Europe. Uh, if I, if I want to fly to Amsterdam, Ron, uh, you know, in June or July you know, what's going to happen? What do I need? That's the kind of, you know, what, what is it that, because it's not only uh, making these things available, but are they accepted or is a U.S. system accepted in the EU? Is there even, you know, a system that people will accept? I mean, that just kind of basic thing that people are, I think, asking. Um, there's another question. This is from Doyle McManus from the Los Angeles Times, and he's asking, you know, uh, back to Deanne's question about the airline industry, should we expect airlines to introduce vaccinated flights for customers who rather not travel with unvaccinated people and then perhaps open kinds of flights, uh, you know, as well? Uh, would there be that type of distinction that be, might be coming our way? Um, 
there's a second question he has, which is back on the federal government and the role of the federal government, which the Biden administration said, you know, we're not going to get involved in this, but isn't the federal government actually the most appropriate and efficient answer to the question who should be the issue of a standardized certificate of this kind? Um, they do have something called the passport office after all. Uh, and then there are these other issues, you've all touched on them, but let me let me come back and see if we can try to get uh, more specifics on, on the medical challenges. Isn't there still a medical issue here that just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean you're not an, uh, potentially a carrier. Uh, so what does this really, this, this certifies that you're maybe somewhat safer, but uh, what are you doing to other people? Um, isn't there also an issue really, really seriously on the digital security front? Um, the cybersecurity people I would know would say, uh, this is right for data harvesting, uh, counterfeiting, uh, it, you can't secure it, uh, anything that we're talking about so far, it's just insecurable from people who would wanna break into these uh, systems. Um, and then there's the, still the political issues which you touched on, but let me, let me again, also maybe Ron, also on the, you know, in the US we're having a big debate on this issue, civil liberties, equity, privacy. Uh, what's the debate like in, in, in Europe on this? Is, is there backlash to these ideas? Uh, yeah, also, so that's a whole bunch of questions. I'll let you, uh, you know, come back to whatever, pick and choose, but Ron, maybe you can come, uh, come back into the conversation. Um, yes, of course. Um, I'll just answer uh, two of them. One is, what can you expect entering the European Union this summer? Um, first of all, we will have a unified uh, interoperable um, um, green certificate for the EU citizens, and they can show that while entering. And most countries in the EU will accept some other form of proof that you have uh, been vaccinated and, and will try to uniform, get some sort of a uniform approach over the union. Um, what we try to do now is come to an interoperable framework with um, inter internationally outside of the union also. So with uh, the airline sector, with the WHO, uh, with ICAO, to be able to, to um, have an interoperable worldwide framework. Um, our efforts for now are uh, aimed at at least a EU interoperable framework. Um, and, and secondly, the, um, the question, is there a debate? Yes, there is a lot of debate in the union. Um, it's about trust, mainly. Sometimes it's more medical, like uh, what's the risk of transmitting the disease while being vaccinated? You pose the question yourself too. Um, and what we try to do is use the digital possibilities to enhance the situation. For example, it's possible to come up with a digital certificate that does not um, um, and enables um, uh, uh, persons being tracked around um, um, the, the, their visits in certain countries. You can do that by changing QR codes every few seconds. You cannot change an, a QR code that has been printed on paper. So what we try to do is come up with a more privacy preserving way of doing this in a digital society to um, enable people trusting, and what it's all about trust, trusting um, the way we uh, handle uh, their, their proof of uh, vaccination or a negative test. All right, uh, Ryan, Deanne, any other points? Sure, I, I wanna talk about two issues, uh, one related to the global interoperability picture and one related to the question of rights and equity. Um, so on the global uh, level, there are many efforts underway to try to harmonize and standardize a lot of the different standards proposals, the systems being deployed. Uh, there's one in particular that we've thrown our weight behind and are collaborating with called the Good Health Pass Initiative, um, which started by establishing a set of 12 principles that they felt absolutely must be uh, uh, answered and, and, and it set a pretty high bar for uh, uh, the expectations around privacy and equity. Uh, and uh, while its focus is on international travel, um, I think it's important, and I think people involved in the, in the project realize that people will want to use these uh, outside of that context. And this is important because when I'm crossing a border, my expectations of privacy are pretty modest, right? I don't post on Facebook or, or wherever if, I, if I'm crossing a border, uh, so it's not necessarily public knowledge, but certainly the governments themselves know, uh, and 
and likely credit bureaus and things like that, right? But when I'm going to a concert or if I'm uh, going to a restaurant or if I'm going to use it in more local environments, then uh, we really need to have that up front. And you can't just add this privacy component later. I mean, we tried to do that with email and have failed. Um, we did that with the web and kind of really succeeded with a whole lot of work. But if we don't answer that early on here, that question of reusability of uh, exactly like what Ron talked about, that QR code changing each time as you visit, yet still serving as a valid proof, right? Those are some really thorny issues. And I'd really like to be able to take my digital version of that white card and use it to go to a concert here, get on a plane, go to Amsterdam, go to a concert there and have the trust be transitive across that whole system, right? With the public health authorities involved in answering, you know, are, you know, what's acceptable in terms of which, which vaccine, that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, a level of convenience, and, but also a sense of data sovereignty that otherwise I wouldn't have. Um, can, I, uh, so, can I ask you on Brian, just on that point, but at the moment, unless I misunderstood Ron's point, uh, we don't have something like that. We're all working on our own projects. The EU is doing just for itself. My, my uh, example of American citizen flying to Amsterdam uh, you know, how do, how do we make this work? And if there's, a, there's a wave one of these apps that we're they're seeing now that we should look at very much the way that we looked at the uh, Mosaic web browser. I, I, if anyone can, you know, is that old, uh, like me, um, really the first wave of these apps that is meant to kind of understand the landscape and try to get something out there to help society reopen. Uh, but if any of these efforts, Good Health Pass and, and the stuff that we work on and the COVID Creds Initiative uh, come, come to bear, bear fruit, uh, you will see a second wave of apps that are more interoperable, that are more about management of certificates, uh, about putting more power in the consumer's hands and true interoperability. And an example of this interop that came up on another conversation was a woman who, who called in and said, you know, I got my first shot of a vaccine in Florida then my second shot in New York. And when I went to the Excelsior Pass uh, website to get a credential, um, it, all, the, the uh, immunization information system, the IIS that New York went to look it up in only saw one shot. So I couldn't get my pass. Do I go get a third shot <laughs> in New York to be able to get the pass? That's broken. And that's potentially a place where some federal leadership in the US to help harmonize these information systems to play a backseat role, certainly allow, to allow the private sector to work on these wallets and, and, and other systems, but, but to play that lightweight coordination role across the, the state health authorities and, and, and others would be, would be extremely valuable to get more quickly to that second wave of apps that are truly more interoperable. Couldn't agree more, Brian, and I can tell you that that's something that the White House and the Office of the National Coordinator are working on right now. Um, this is all new stuff, right? I mean, when the vaccines rolled out, we all got our our, uh, our paper card, which um, I understand you get those laminated for free at Staples, but that's still not a guarantee that that card won't get in the washing machine, won't get destroyed, won't get lost, your dog will eat it, etc. And you know, the whole idea of a credential was really started to to put that one white card digital, but also to your point, Brian, to preserve privacy. And I think that's something that we have looked to bake into these apps, but as these mature, that continues to be a thread throughout the fabric. Um, lastly, I just also wanted to, um, to comment on the travel. Um, I, I do, I, I love your idea, Brian. I too wanna to go to a concert, I miss concerts so badly, and I would love to go to Amsterdam, go to a concert I've never been. Um, but yes, the idea of having the seamless system that preserves privacy is portable and that can enable those venues um, where we do have a lot of people packed in. And to your point, Dan, we don't know everything about how long this vaccine lasts in terms of antibody protection. This is all, this is why they call it the novel coronavirus. Everything about this is novel. And I think we will get there. I mean, we've come this fast, this far so fast. Uh, I, I do believe we will get there in terms of understanding more. Um, lastly, to the question from the LA Times, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't see uh, a vaccinated plane in an unvaccinated flight. I do think that would open up to a class action lawsuit somewhere along the lines. All right, Melinda? Can I just add something on infection immunity? I think the discussions I've been um, hearing a lot too is, is, you know, it's not just one vaccine, so it will be quite complicated. And I think people need to hear more about that, you know, understanding the duration of immunity um, uh, between you know, these different vaccines. And the other one is we know that perhaps some uh, variants of concern might compromise existing vaccines. So one of the discussions that's you know, come about, you know, could these be revoked 
um, you know, if my vaccine is no longer resistant to, um, you know, the variant, uh, and what if I'm in Greece or something, and, you know, and, and that happens there, what will happen to me then? So there's all, and Brian gave some examples of, you know, cross-state immunization, and I think those are the kind of questions that, that the public also really needs some, some more information and understanding about, but, but also just clarity that the science changes, that we're, we're understanding this at the moment as it, uh, as it rolls out. Thank you. I just note, I, I didn't get much of an answer to the digital uh, hacking uh, problem. I'll just mention that, but let me weave in a couple of questions now that we have also gotten about. <clears throat> One is about um, how, you know, companies, organizations, governments are going to deal with the need to have paper certificates available, not just digital. This has been a, you know, mostly a digital conversation, but they're back to equity issues. You know, not everyone, uh, older people, certain income brackets have access to a smartphone or internet. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Shouldn't, shouldn't that also be accepted just the same way as, as a digital option? Um, and to your point, I think a number you've said, we don't know yet because the testing out six months, you know, we don't know how long the vaccines are gonna be good. Are vaccine certificates a temporary solution or is this seen as really a long-term solution for travel? Uh, you know, what happens, some countries reach herd immunity and, and others don't. And, uh, you know, how do we deal with that type of uh, uh, difference? Uh, and then uh, we have one last question here. Again, a hypothetical just to take, you know, people are very personal with this. They want to know what it means for them, right? What about a family traveling where the adults are vaccinated and the children are not? Uh, how does this help anybody, uh, you know, in that situation. Would you like to take on any of those? Dion? We can address the, the equity, and, and that's why we look to make this printable in this, this QR code. And I know we've talked about the idea that if you keep changing it, you'll have to go back and keep printing it. I think you have to look at also what data fields are included in that. So we tried to put as minimal data as possible into that QR code. No one, to my knowledge, is really using this to track your whereabouts or to track how many concerts you go to this summer. Um, but that is something that we put in mind with the design of our process, simply because we know not everybody is um, blessed enough to have a smartphone. Not everybody maybe wants it on their smartphone. Yeah, Ron. Shall I add to that? Yes, so please. The, the EU situation is that the uh, regulation demands to offer a paper form also. And, um, and, and also on the paper form, you have three different QR codes. One is, one is for domestic use without personal identification. One is for cross-border use with personal identification. And one is for medical use with a detailed um, identification of all the vaccine shots um, um, and their, their dates. So there are three use cases within the EU and all of them have different data elements um, in them. And secondly, um, it is a wonderful time in which we, we, in an open source app, prove how to do zero knowledge proofing, having a, a system in which there is no data other, other than in the app of the, of the holder. Um, and so there's no central database that can be hacked or attacked. Um, so we are in a time where a digital waste may be used to do it in a more solid privacy preserving way, um, if we do it right. Yeah, I really want to build on what, what Ron says. The, there's been recent advances in cryptography and mathematics that really uh, much are much better aligned with this idea of being able to prove a thing without having to show you a lot of information about that thing, right? Uh, kind of the equivalent of if I do go to a concert and I show my driver's license, the driver, the, uh, the, 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 the person looking at that license, you know, if they had limited to people over the age of 18, they're not writing down my birthday. They're just looking to see, is this person over 18? Okay, great, they can go in. Um, and that same kind of zero knowledge system that zero knowledge proofs needs to be something that we we standardize across the, the, the system and make make uh, really meet up with the the, the users expectations of, of how these systems should work they should work like paper paper is remarkably privacy preserving we need to remember uh, it's one reason why election systems should really uh, always be built on voter verified paper ballots right um, uh, the data harvesting harvesting risk no one should dismiss um, you know, today we do have uh, large databases that do track who's immunized in the United States 
States, we have 11 of these IISs that uh, most of the facilities, not all of them, but most of the facilities that have been issuing uh, uh, vaccinations do record that data to, and that is used for public health purposes. That's Those aren't systems that should be checked in real time to see is this person vaccinated, but those may be the systems from which these certificates are issued to people who have already been vaccinated uh, so that they can then take that with them and, and prove them in the different places they need to prove them. Um, uh, but the important thing is to provide that separation. Uh, and I think in doing that, we avoid a lot of the, the security and data harvesting risk Risks, but we always have to have those front center as we're designing these systems. I, I would agree, Brian. And we also need to have just better guardrails in general on a lot of our data use. Um, you know, we've been looking for a, a national privacy law in the U.S. for quite some time. And I think it's just not just um, for immunization tracking or use of a QR code, but overall data use as well. And I think it really has to, we really have to think about the communication with the public as well, too, because all of the things we've discussed here in this group and, and whoever's um, joining us as, as well now are, are interested. But um, the, the main discussion in the UK newspapers, and I think that's, that's probably mirrored in many places, is really about tracking and surveillance and hacking and security and data linkage. So, you know, I think that, that that discussion has to, and it has to happen where people are. So uh, um, not just putting it on a governmental website saying we're being transparent as well, which sometimes happens, but actually to engage with people where they are. Yeah, I mean, I come back to the with adults vaccinated, the kids not, or, or if we, you say this is just the initial wave of innovation and, you know, we will get further but for somebody hearing this right now and wanting to go out uh, in public, I mean, where do they start? Uh, it just seems like, you know, where, where do they turn? Uh, is it really just every community is doing its own thing? Uh, and if you go on a certain airline, it's gonna be different than another one. Um, it just, it seems like just a, you know, a, a whole jungle. And, and it's hard for, I think, an individual to understand what it means for them, just in their own community. So my sense is it's it's just a question of back to communication. How do we communicate what is available, uh, what is secure, uh, who, how do we know that? And that's just in our local uh, environment. My sense for the conversation, but tell me if I'm wrong, is that when we get the international cross-border, not just the Schengen zone, but now if Europeans want to travel to the United States, for instance, just put it the other way around, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any, any system in place. We still have travel bans, frankly. Uh, so, you know, how do people think about their summer or just their families, if they're extended families, how are they going to understand how to cope with this? Yeah, that's a really good question, Dan. And, you know, to your point, communication is absolutely going to be key. Uh, the cruise ships have put their stake on the ground and are currently in conversations with the CDC to determine some things. Airlines are really, I think, trying to figure this out. Um, to the earlier question about children who can't be vaccinated because the vaccines aren't indicated for young children, um, I do believe they still have to have a negative COVID test. But again, to your point, depending on which destination they're going to visit um, travel bans notwithstanding. So I do think communication is important. I think we can look to the travel industry and its association to perhaps put out some more guidance, but you know, this is, this is complicated and there aren't any easy answers. Um, I do know that you know, going out in your, in your individual neighborhoods is easy, but looking to go abroad right now is, is quite a challenging conversation. The uh, um, the Good Health Pass Collaborative uh, initiative that that we're participating in uh, is planning to, to to put out a set of specifications and guidance for implementation uh, in the June July timeframe. I would expect to see because uh, implementations are being built concurrent to that process uh, to meet those standards uh, that you would soon see after that the first available software, the first available companies to go and implement these for 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 different nations or or to talk about and kind of how how the wallet interoperability picture works. Uh, I don't think it's too op uh, over optimistic to say that by Q end of Q3 or Q4, we start to see this second wave of apps that really do provide that level of interoperability. Until then, you know, there's going to be better versions of this and worse. And I would look to groups like Consumer Reports and the ACLU to really do a thorough vetting of a lot of these apps and make recommendations about adoption or, or, or to pass on them. 
I would also look to the vaccine credential initiative and that group of, in, of companies that are working on this as well. Uh, again, looking at common standards and frameworks. Yeah. I guess the discussion here too has been as well. Um, so I, I gave some examples in the UK, <laughs> some, some different apps that have been developed and um, we had our first test and trace app that was about 10 million and that had to be put aside uh, because it didn't work very well. And then there was another one um, put together. And I think that citizens are increasingly worried about, um, you know, a lot of money going into these initial, and they're often government funded going into these initial technologies. So I do hope, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm happy to hear about these, you know, phase two <laughs> apps, but, um, you know, when, when there's so many government cuts at the moment, I think a lot of citizens are like, why can't everybody just get together? I realize it's a market competition system, but you know, and I'm so happy that there's these, these initiatives that bring people together and the European Union's working together and open source. I mean, yes, but um, people do get frustrated when they, when they see this happening and it's coming out of taxpayers' money. Yes, I'm, I agree with that, but um, there's another side to it. Um, the Dutch government decided to do it themselves because of trust. If we want trust, we'll have to do it um, fully transparent in an open source way without private um, ways of earning money on my data. So what we did is we do it fully open, transparent. It's on, your, it's on, on the designs and the source code on a daily basis. Um, and we work together with um, WHO, the, the union and all other parties involved worldwide. And we do so um, in a way in which we use the novel um, uh, um, uh, techniques in, for example, zero knowledge proving and, and cryptography um, to, to ensure that it is safe, that it's open, um, and, it, and people can trust it. Um, and and trust, is, trust is key in this. Let me uh, just, uh, just bore in on that a little bit. There, between, there is a country that uh, just left the European Union, yet is still in Europe. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of trust going on uh, at the moment there. So I don't have to take my US example. What if somebody from the UK wants to come to the EU or vice versa? Uh, how would that work? Because it seems also not to be a place where there's some interoperability. That is still, that's still the same. So we have to do that in a more worldwide way. Um, and I agree with that. So we have to uh, ensure that we coordinate worldwide, but still preserve privacy and, and security in a way that um, enables people to have trust. Yeah, who should do that when you say worldwide? Who's, what, what's the body? Is there what, we try to do, what we try to do is do that, talk to all, the, to all the bodies involved, so not choose one. So we, as a member state of the EU, do so within the EU, uh, but, but the EU um, also uh, does that with the WHO, for example, IATO, ICAO, um, IATA, um, so with um, uh, all the parties involved to come up with something that will work worldwide. Yeah. In my sense of this is I uh, think again about just the family or the individual um, that this summer is going to be complicated and <laughs> uh, that uh, it's going to be very hard to tease this out. There might be, you know, another wave simplifying things, but it's not happening, as Brian said, till maybe later this year. Uh, you can see a sense of impatience because the vaccinations are rolling out, people want to get out, and yet, uh, how do we do it? So uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I think, In a sense, I think we're kind of almost back where we were, we're more, but at a higher level of confusion, maybe, about uh, what all this will do. Uh, so I, clearly, it's a, it's a conversation we, we need to continue to have, and I appreciate that you were able to spend time with us on this. Um, to our audience, thank you for participating. Uh, this, uh, it, this is a public event, which we're uh, recording, and it'll be available on the Wilson Center website uh, for others to see. We'll try to send it around. And uh, I wanna thank everyone again for joining us. Uh, it was really good discussion and uh, helped, helped us all understand where, where we are. I wish everyone safety, good health, and, uh, and continue thriving. So thank you again. Take care, everybody. Thank you.